after, O Lord, and we give you thanks that we can enjoy your presence uh, and gather together in fullness of joy. Lord, we ask that your spirit would fall afresh and you on us today, that you would open our ears and our eyes, our minds and our hearts to hear from you in a new and in a fresh way today. Now, how do you be heard across? Decrease me, O Lord, and increase you in me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people say, Amen. The song you just heard, Long Train Running, was released in 1973 by rock group The Doobie Brothers. How many have heard of The Doobie Brothers? <laughs> the song was on their album, The Captain and Me, and the meaning of Long Train Running is not known because the song's lyrics are not really about anything or anyone. Doobie Brothers band member Tom Johnson said that the song came from the band ad living to a tune they had created on stage and they had been playing it for about three years before giving the song actual words. Johnson said he just considered it a bar song without a lot of merit, but did not want to cut the song from the album because the tune was so popular and so catchy. There was another band member, Teddy Templeman, who convinced Johnson to write words to the song. So Johnson wrote the lyrics, lyrics about trains, likely from his upbringing in the Central California Valley that would fit the tune of the song. The song, referred to by Tom Johnson as a throwaway song, it debuted on the Billboard Hot 100 charts in the top 10 coming in at number 8. I think the reason the song was and is still so popular is the chorus. Without love, where would we be now? Without love. The chorus is a prophetic one calling our attention to the fact that we all long to be loved. And as human beings in a flawed world, we can and do love one another the best that we can. Sometimes well, but most times in damaging and hurtful ways. But there is one, and will always be one, who loves us so deeply and so fully and so perfectly. Without Jesus' love, we don't know where we be or who we be. Jesus describes the depth of God's love for us and how God longs to love us in his answer to one of the disciples' requests. Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. The John the disciple refers to is John the Baptist. And Jesus answers the disciple, and he answers in three parts. In part one, Jesus gives a direct answer with a model prayer, which we have come to know as the Lord's Prayer. This version of the Lord's Prayer emphasizes that the very holiness of God is what the disciple should stand on in prayer. Because it is God's holiness and God's love that makes his kingdom realized on earth. And the proof of God's kingdom on earth is that all are fed, and forgiveness is practiced, and God keeps the faithful from temptation. And so that the disciples understand how to come to God, Jesus begins the second part of his answer by telling the story of what one commentator calls the shameless friend. The story Jesus tells is almost ridiculous because he says that God is like a friend at midnight who is awakened and pestered by another friend, a shameless friend, who's looking for food for someone that he is welcoming into his home. And since the world and culture of Jesus' time valued hospitality and welcoming, a person having food or drink in their home to welcome visitors and friends was a big deal. My husband's from one such culture, the Democratic Republic of Congo, so that when we invite people to our home and welcome people, I'll take an inventory of the refrigerator and the cabinets, and I'm like, oh great, we're good. Catholic is like, no, we're not. There's never enough food or drink for folks that we welcome into our house. It was seen as shameful to not have food or drink to offer them. Jesus tells the disciples that even though the friend who has been awakened at midnight will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. The word persistence here in the Greek means persistence to the point of annoyance. 
Finally, Jesus tells the disciples in the third part of his answer to be persistently annoying in the presence of God in prayer by asking and searching and knocking for whatever they need and want. Jesus tells them that because God is good and longs to love us, everyone who asks <coughs> receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Church, God loves us so deeply and so fully and longs to give good gifts to us. So what stops us from coming to God with our requests and our petitions? What stops us from letting God love us? Many of us walk around carrying shame about something. And it is this shame that stops us sometimes from letting God love us. Shame says, I am bad, or I am not worthy because of something that we've done or left undone, or because of who we are, or because of the families we come from, or because of where we come from, or because of what we may be experiencing in our lives right now, or because of what others have said about us or because of how others have treated us, or because of unanswered prayers. Frank, Fiona, Carl, Lip, Ian, Debbie, and Liam make up the Gallagher family in the Showtime television series. Who knows what I'm talking about? You can say <laughs> shameless. <laughs> I heard about this show from my brother and other friends a couple years ago. And before some of you say, I don't think my pastor should be watching that show. <laughs> As some of you may know, the show is about a poor family in Chicago led by an alcoholic single father of six children, Frank Gallagher. The younger children are raised by the oldest child, Fiona, <coughs> with each one battling and experiencing their own issues around poverty, and sexuality, addiction, mental health, romantic relationships, and identity. The family and other neighbors and people they meet all struggle with feeling some shame around the issues that they carry. <coughs> so all of them do things to hide their shame in one way or another, through rage, or anger, or addiction, or unhealthy relationships, or just being plain named. At the core of the show, all the characters search to belong, and to be liked, and to be loved. As Fiona says when talking to her brother Ian in the first episode, when he asks why she bothers with their alcoholic father, she says, I guess so I can feel wanted. We are not much different from the young family. Events and circumstances we experience in our lives and in our communities and even in our churches can make us feel unworthy to go to a loving God pouring out our petitions and requests from our hearts. So we respond to our experiences by feeling ashamed of who we are or ashamed of what we have done or what others have done to us. Or we respond by being shameless about the things we say and how we behave and how we treat ourselves and other people by saying, I've been through some things, so this is how I am. I can't change. Either love me as I am or leave me alone. So then we block ourselves from letting God and others love us because we won't open the door. Dr. Brene Brown, renowned shame and vulnerability researcher and author of the book Daring Greatly, presented a TED talk about shame and vulnerability. And Dr. Brown talked about how shame doesn't allow us to let anyone love us or be vulnerable with anyone. She says shame is a gremlin that says, uh-oh, you're not good enough. And if you happen to be successful by accident, then that voice also says, who do you think you are? Dr. Brown says it is vulnerability that is essential for us to live wholehearted lives, saying that vulnerability is the birthplace of 
innovation and creativity and change. And when we hold up our failures against who we want to be, it can be highly adaptive. Church, God in Christ has already held up our failure, our sin at the cross. And in rising from the grave, proclaims who he wants us to be and who we can be by God's grace. Healed and whole and free people of God who heal and free others in Jesus' name by telling our story of God loving us. God longs for us to be shameless in the greatest way. Letting God love us by bringing our requests and petitions to him. Church, Jesus' great shameless love for us overcoming hell and death shows us we can lay everything down at Jesus' feet. We can lay down the shame of our past and our present and our future because God loves us. And putting our faith in Jesus every day continually opens us up to God's love so that we can be redeemed, so our souls and spirits can be renewed, and so our identities are no longer I am bad, only I am worthy because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for me. When one of the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, Jesus gave a model, but he didn't stop there. Because form and fashion and appearance is not what Jesus is after. Jesus wants us to engage prayer as a way of life, shamelessly and fearlessly giving our requests and petitions to God, letting God love us. When we do this, our hearts are changed and those who meet us are transformed too. In our homes and in our communities and in our churches. When we let God love us, God's kingdom is made visible in us. I traveled to Washington, D.C. in July to finish a course for ordination, and I stayed with my Aunt Audrey. To know my Aunt Audrey is to love her. She is an 83-year-old woman who is full of sass and a quick wit and has more energy than any of us. She still runs a daycare out of her house. My aunt is known by many in her community and church for her healing presence and her honesty and her love and her but it wasn't always this way. My aunt came from an abusive family and had a very abusive childhood. When she became older, she raised her little sister, entering the military to help pay for her sister's education and her mother's survival at the hands of their abusive father. She was always a fighter, surviving two abusive marriages while raising four children as a single working mother. My aunt had always known who God was, but did not let God love her fully because so many people had let her down, including her own parents. <clears throat> My aunt discovered the healing and liberating power of Jesus Christ through a couple who began picking her up on Sundays, and they still do, to attend church with them while she was separated from her second husband, my uncle. She shared her faith journey with me when I stayed with her. My aunt told me that once she opened up and let God love her, God gave her the power and the strength to lay down her anger and her sharp tongue and her temper. Now don't get me wrong, church. Her transformation didn't happen overnight, and she wouldn't say that it did either. But as my aunt shared with me, even now, when I feel my temper getting ready to start up, I take a moment to breathe so the spirit can calm me down. Because I know who I used to be. And no one wants to see that woman come back. Church, letting God love us in prayer and for our whole lives is not a one-time thing that happens. Letting God love us means that every day we have to be shameless and transparent before a holy, loving God about who we are and what we have done or not done and what we most need. And then ask and search in God's presence for whatever we are looking for because God loves us shamelessly, longing to give us good things. 
And then finally, putting our whole trust in God every single day to put things right in our lives and in our communities and the world. Church, without God's love, where would we be? Amen.